I know what you're thinking, but I'm just as surprised as you are to be here. Um, Mr. Patrick, of course, was announced for this meeting, and uh, he hasn't been feeling so good. He's had a cold that's affected his throat, and he was hoping, he rang me yesterday, he said he hoped to be well enough this morning to be able to come, but he rang me back this morning to say, oh, unfortunately, he's not up to scratch, and uh, by uh, Mr. Henderson, here we are. Well, we trust the Lord will come uh, and bless our time together. We're going to make a start by turning to the hymn 623. 623, God is here, and that to bless us with the Spirit's quickening power. 623, we stand together as we sing, please. together, please, in the attitude of prayer, and seek the Lord's face for his blessing upon our coming together. Let's each one pray. Our loving God and gracious Father in heaven, it is with rejoicing we bow again in thy sacred presence. We come before thee in that name that's above every name. In the name of thy dear Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, we thank thee for him who loved us and gave himself for us. Lord, we're such a privileged people this evening. We thank thee for the opportunity to gather together with those of like precious faith. 
And we thank that we have the promise of thy word that if there were only two or three met together in thy name, thou hast said, there am I in the midst. And Lord, we've been singing these words, God is here and that to bless us and we believe it. We pray, Lord, that thou wilt indeed have a blessing for our souls this evening. We thank thee for the avenue of prayer where we can approach onto the highest throne, the throne of glory. We can, we can come before thy face and all because of him who loved us. We thank thee for that precious shed blood of Calvary's lamb. Thank you, Lord, that by faith it has been applied to our hearts our sins, which were many, have all been blotted out. They'll never be remembered against us anymore. Cast into the sea of God's forgetfulness. And Lord, we rejoice this evening that we can have this audience with thyself. Oh, there are those, Lord, who would run to their local councillors or representatives of government to, to, to have matters attended to, but we can come to the highest. We can come to the highest power and we come, Lord, recognizing our own nothingness, recognizing we are poor and needy. The best we could ever hope to be is just poor sinners, saved only by thy grace. But we thank thee thou hast chosen us in Christ from the foundation of the world. And indeed, Lord, thou hast bidden us come boldly to the throne of grace, that there we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And we acknowledge, Lord, we're living in a day of great need, great spiritual need. The world is in a mess today because of sin. Sin abounds in every hand, but thy word would remind us that where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. And so we thank the Lord we can. We can come with confidence before thee, and our prayer is that thy presence would be felt in this meeting house. We thank you for allowing us to be here. We thank you for the desire to be here. We've got to acknowledge this is not of ourselves. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous. We pray, Lord, that thy presence would indeed be felt, that thou wilt minister unto us through thy word, prepare our hearts and minds for that season when we will seek thy face in prayer. And, Lord, we do remember thy servant, Mr. Patrick. Thank you for him. Thank you, Lord, for his years of ministry. And realize this evening, whilst he would dearly love to be on this platform, whilst he's laid aside, we pray that thou will come as the great physician and just grant him that healing touch in the body and minister unto him and raise him up again to his wanted health and strength. We pray for all, Lord, who are laid aside at this time, maybe some belonging to this flock, who would love to be in the prayer meeting but just can't make it out. We pray for such. Thou minister to them if some are listening in at home. I'll be their portion. Thank you, Lord. You're not limited to, to church buildings. And we're glad we can seek the Lord anywhere. And we thank thee, thine ear is open unto our cry. And our cry is, Lord, come and bless our souls today. Like Jabez of old, we would pray, Oh, that thou hast blessed me indeed. Lord, hide man out of sight. Cause us to focus upon thyself. Stir our souls this evening, we pray thee, as we look upon the land and in all its dearth, in all its deadness, we, we cry to thee, Lord, for the breath of God upon our own souls and upon this nation. We, we can look back and read history and we, we know that there have been those occasions in the past when, when there were a mighty revival swept across this land. And Lord, we would just pray, come and do it again. Oh, bless us tonight. Encourage our hearts. Do our souls good. And grant that in this place, we'll know the Lord's nearness, that here we will be truly blessed, and that in all things thy name would be magnified. Continue with us. Do us good, we pray thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's further sing, please, from 624. 624, here in thy name we're gathered, come. And revive us, O oh Lord. <coughs>
going to invite you to turn, please, for a scripture reading to Isaiah's prophecy in the chapter 64. Isaiah 64, reading from the opening verse. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down into thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down. The mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath I seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Thou madest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth. For we have sinned, and though those is continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and has consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, thou art the potter, we are all the work of thy hand. Be not wroth very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. The holy cities are a wilderness, Zion is a wilderness, Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house, where our fathers praised thee, is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? Amen. May the Lord bless these verses to our hearts. Is that Opening verse that I want to think upon for just a moment or two. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. You'll know that down through the years there have been those occasions when the presence of God has been felt. I mean felt in a special, a very special manner. God's people have experienced Something of a rekindling of the dying embers of the fires of love for God and for Jesus Christ. The church has gone through periods of coldness, times of dead ritualism, whenever God's people had a name to be saved, but there was little evidence of any zeal for the furtherance of the work of God. Sad times. Little enthusiasm for the extension of Christ's kingdom. I and lamentably little evidence of any burden for the lost souls of men. You know, if we stop there, that's a challenge. But then God has moved, moved somebody's heart to seek his face in prayer. God will not leave himself without a witness. He has moved somebody to seek him in prayer after maybe a prolonged time of waiting upon God. He has sent his Holy Spirit and has caused a reinvigorating of soul to be brought about. And as a result of such a move, attitudes have been changed. People have been baptized with new zeal and new desires for the blessing of God. Now, there's one thing to look for a blessing from God. But ought ought we not to be seeking the Lord, not just for his blessings, seeking the Lord for who he is? We call such times revival. Nobody can can really explain how it happens. 
They just know that something does happen and such persons have found themselves loving God far more than ever before. I, and more than that, yearning after his presence and his power in their lives. Beloved, do we really know anything about it? Now they've had, had to acknowledge that whatever it is that has come over them, it's not of themselves. It has to be of God himself. I'm sure we've all read of events in places like the Isle of Lewis, even in this province. And of course, it, it, it also, such a move has also reached, it has overflown, and the unsaved and their thousands have been brought under conviction of sin and have been brought to seek the Lord. What marvelous times those must be. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could experience that in our day? But this is what we believe the Church of Jesus Christ needs in this 21st century. Men and women across the country and farther afield are, are living such worldly, godless lives. It is seriously worrying. Aren't we living in a day when there's not only no fear of God, but a ready willingness to discredit him and to almost determine to prove that ah, we can live without God? God's not wanted by his own creation. And we fear for souls going out into eternity without Christ. Hence it is our prayer with Isaiah that God would indeed visit us with a breath of revival before we lose him altogether. Prayer for revival comes when people recognize that we're not where we need to be with the Lord. We need revival far more than we need a change of government. Now, I believe we've got a new prime minister today in number 10. But if you read her CV, you'll know some of those things that she countenances that would be grieving to the Lord. I'm not going to Take time to go into that. And you study her profile. And you'll see that she too needs the touch of God. We have elections from time to time. And politicians hope to see some old faces back in power. And some new faces joining them on our councils or in government. Here's something. Here's something here that this land needs a thousand times more than a new government. We really need a move of God's Holy Spirit to stir up the people of God, first of all, because there's that lukewarmness abroad. When people claim to be saved but have no desire to come to the place of prayer to seek the Lord for his blessing. Of course, we're preaching to the converted now, aren't we? But too many Christians aren't taking their direction from God's word anymore. But they just do their own thing. And worse than that, there are too many who are content to let the work of God fall into decline and they sadly are not sufficiently concerned about it to call upon God to protect his work or to see it prosper. That's backsliding. And we all have to examine our own hearts. If the church door was to close in the morning... Who would they blame? How many of us would go to the mirror and say, well, it's your fault? It's for reasons like this that we need to be crying to God that he would rend the heavens and come down. What's more, the church needs reviving for the simple reason. Souls are perishing in their multitudes. And there isn't sufficient concern among God's people now, I'm not singling out the congregation in mourn. I'm thinking of the church in general. But there isn't that sufficient concern. That's why so few come to prayer meetings, let's say before the services on the Lord's Day. There's so few to hold up the preacher's hands in prayer, yet they, they expect him to be on fire in the pulpit. They may say they, they want God to bless his work, but they, they'll not come and plead with him to do it. So why should he? God does not bless laziness. And here's Isaiah. 
And it may just be that he was witnessing the same kind of lethargy in the church in his day, as we are seeing in some places today. Hence, he cries out, Oh, that thou wouldst, sorry, oh, that thou wouldst come down. Notice here how he did pray. Oh, that thou wouldst come down. He's reminding God that God has moved in the past. And he just yearns for him to do it again. In this first verse, you notice how he prays. Oh, that thou wouldest come down. The important word here, some commentators will say, is the word oh. It's very significant. It expresses a yearning, a longing for God to move. Oh, that God would come down. When Moses came down from that mountain and found people worshipping that golden calf, he cried out, Oh, what a great sin you've committed. What deep emotion there was in his voice. David said in, in Psalm 14, 7, Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. When the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, he said, and Israel shall be glad. There, there was great desire there that takes, takes one beyond the normal praying. And this was agonizing after God. And Jeremiah speaks of his anguish of soul. Oh, that God would come down. And here's Isaiah in the same frame of mind. Oh, that God would rend the heavens and come down among us and deliver us from this spiritual lethargy. Isaiah's grievance was that Judah had given themselves over to idolatry. And he cries out, Oh, God, will you not come down and turn things around? For the sake of thine own glory, come down and do something. And you can sense the yearning in his heart. Is this not what Ulster needs this evening, beloved? Now, this cry of the prophet is an expression of the, the hopelessness of the situation. The nation is far from God. And whenever you look at some of the legislation we have on our statute books, I mean, think back even a generation ago. Think back 40 years, those who can. Would you ever have dreamed that we would find ourselves in the situation we're in today, where we can court sodomy and, and, and all these gender issues and have, have sodomites parading our streets and, and even the forces of law and order coming out to support them? Who would ever have dreamt this would happen in Northern Ireland? It's obnoxious, it's outrageous. But it's happening. And I wonder as God's people, are we as upset about it as we should be? Or do we just say, well, that's the way the world is these days. Ought we not to be crying to God to come and step in? This nation, beloved. Whilst um, Judah may have been far away from the Lord, we're not any better. Here was Judah, they had by and large shut God out, and Israel, or, or Isaiah rather, he can't do anything about it in his own strength. He recognizes that. He says, Oh Lord, would you not do something? Here's a servant of God, and really he has looked at the situation, and he, it has so tormented his mind, he's just about the end of his tether. He can't abide the things that are going on. In the nation. He has preached the word of God himself, but the people are not listening. They don't want to hear. And you get people like that. Some will saunter into church and wait for the meeting to start, but they, they don't come with a burden of soul for the work of God. Now we're glad people come to church. But they don't come pleading with the Lord that he might move mightily among them and even move on their own hearts. And they don't cry to God for a blessing on the congregation or do they cry to God that he would save that precious soul who's on his way to a lost eternity. 
A man was telling me one time how another man came into his church a fortnight previous, sat down beside him and he says, did you get anything out of that meeting last week? He says, I didn't. That man wasn't at the prayer meeting to seek the Lord for a blessing. Did he think to come and seek the face of God for the blessing that his soul obviously needed? No. He left that to somebody else. I mean, what, what, what sort of fool do some people take God for? He's not Santa Claus coming to throw out blessings willy-nilly to all and sundry. He'd, he'd bless them that seek him for a blessing. And beloved, if we don't have that desire for the blessing of God, then it's time we started praying for it. In Proverbs 8, 17 to 21, God says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit, he said, is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment, that I may cause, may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. You know, the Lord's no disappointment, and he's not stingy. He has blessings for those who come to seek it. And if your soul, beloved, is malnourished, whose fault is not the Lord's? His storehouse is full. The blessings are there to be pleaded and claimed. Oh, that thou was come down. Oh, Lord, that you would stir my soul to get a blessing for my own soul. And you know, part of the blessing is you'll be burdened for other souls. There's nothing promised here for those who are idle. Maybe we need to be crying to God for the desire to cry to God. Our hearts need to be stirred. Our prayer times need to be set alight. Only God has the answer to the situation we find ourselves in. Now here's the prophet. He's put all his effort into preparing his message. He has been diligent in delivering that message, but it seems he's getting nowhere. And so he cries to God, Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down. This is the sort of praying that's needed. Before any move of God can be expected, if prayer for revival is no more than a casual passing comment, then we needn't expect God to do anything. He answers in relation to the extent of the desire expressed. And beloved, I, I, I think we can all, we all need to take this to heart, the preacher included. We really don't cry to God the way we should for his blessing. You know, if, if God were to move in this land tonight the way he did in 1859, wow, how would it affect us? Are we ready for it? Remember that woman who used to come pleading that the judge would avenge her of her adversary? She tormented that judge coming day after day, but she refused to give up until she got what she desired. And beloved, the same applies. If we want to see revival, we've got to cry to God for it day after day until he rends the heavens and comes down. This prayer should be prayed as if our very survival depends upon it. Because it probably does. Oh Lord, if you don't do something, our land is doomed. Oh, that thou hast come down. Jacob may have had his faults. But when he met with that angel, he cried out, I'll not let thee go except thou bless me. Isn't that the kind of determination 
we need in the prayer meeting. But secondly here, what did Isaiah pray for? Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, that thou wouldst come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. Now, as we've been saying, this goes beyond ordinary praying. This word rend, it means to tear apart. You remember when Jacob received Joseph's bloodstained coat when his brothers led their father to believe that Joseph had been killed. Genesis 37 and 34 tells us that Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his, mourned for his son many days. It was a show of immense distress to tear one's garments to pieces. And this is the thought behind Isaiah's prayer. That God would literally tear the heavens apart and come down and do something for and with and among his people. We've read or heard about the events of 1859 when many souls in this country were found lying on the ground crying to God for mercy on their sinful souls. Unsaved people of all ages, young children, middle-aged men and women, even the elderly were found prostrate on the ground, pleading with God to save them from falling down into hell. And God's people were likewise found crying to God that, to, to bless them with his power in their lives and that he would deliver them from empty, half-hearted Christianity. Some people will claim that George Whitfield was the greatest preacher that ever lived. Others would credit that accolade to see it Spurgeon. Now, it may be said that neither men ever set out to look for any applause from any man. But they both gave themselves unreservedly to God to be used for his glory. Anyhow, Whitfield was preaching in America, in America where audiences of somewhere in the region of 30,000 uh, maybe, maybe on, on any night. And he recorded in a journal that God came down and multitudes were blessed. At that time, there was a, a famous movie and theater star by the name of David Garrick. Even though he was much into the things of the world, yet he, he, he liked to go and hear Mr. Whitfield preaching. His theatrical colleagues, of course, thought he was out of his mind going to hear somebody like that, but he went anyway. And Garrick said that he would give half of his fortune. And remember, this is a man who's into the movies and he's in theatre, so he'd be used putting on an act, uh, pronouncing his words right and giving, emphasising the right phrases in the right manner and so on. He said he would give half of his fortune to be able to pronounce the word Mesopotamia the way George Whitfield pronounced it. But he said he would give all of his fortune to be able to say, oh, the way, Whitfield, the way Whitfield said it. I have to stop doing that. Oh, that God would come down. This isn't something we can act this is not something for the stage. This has to come from the heart. Jonathan Edwards preached what is now famously known as that sermon entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You should look it up and, and, and read it. You can just imagine some preachers thundering out the message of warning to ungodly men and women, urging them to flee to Christ for mercy. It, it, it's a classic sermon. Yet, in preaching it, Edwards never raised his voice. In fact, he was quite soft-spoken. And what's more, the man suffered very poor eyesight. And uh, he, he, he had to hold his notes uh, up to his face like that there and, and if the preacher came to Kilkeel and, and preached from his notes like that there you wouldn't think it would be a lot of them 
But that was Jonathan Edwards. Softly spoken, nearly as blind as a butt. But I tell you, used of God. And as he preached that message, sinners in the hands of an angry God, God broke through. And sinners were found falling on their faces all over the meeting houses, wherever he preached. The Spirit of God had come down. Men were brought to see themselves standing before an angry God. And by the Spirit's power, those people were broken and penitent before him. Oh, that God would do it again. God came down in Wales in 1904. Many pubs had to close down. Custom was gone. Coal miners in the pits were broken. The Spirit of God just moved. And the miners down in the pits digging the coal, they, they were broken before God. There was no preacher down there. It was just the Spirit of God moved. And it is said whenever those fellows come up out of the pit at the end of their shift, there were clean marks down their faces because the tears had been flowing. And they actually had to retrain. I'm sure you've heard the story. They had to retrain the pit ponies. They would have pulled the, the coal bogies along rails where they tipped their coal into the conveyor belt that took it to the surface. And those poor animals were so used being shouted at and abused and smacked. Whenever the miners got wonderfully saved by the grace of God, there was, there was such a change come over them. They began to treat the ponies with care and consideration, but the animals didn't understand the new instructions when they spoke quietly to them. And they weren't used to being spoken to nicely. They, they, they just wouldn't move. So used being shouted at and abused. In fact, they had to bring the ponies up and retrain them to obey gentle commands. God had come down. Why did Isaiah pray like this? Simply because he saw the need. Verses 1 and 2. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, that thou wouldst come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence as when the melting fire burneth. Fire causeth the waters to boil to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble. At thy presence. When did you last see somebody tremble under the sound of the word of God? Nations today don't tremble at the mention of God's name. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry takes the Lord's name in vain. It's ridiculous. It's scandalous, blasphemous. You could hardly turn your TV on, but somebody's taking the Lord's name in vain, and you hear it in the street. You even hear children that, of course, they're hearing it in the home. Too busy trampling the Lord's name into the gutter. No fear of God before men's eyes. That needs to change. What does it take to make mountains tremble? They can withstand all weathers. But it seems that Isaiah's mind was going back here to Mount Sinai where God came down and met with Moses. That mountain trembled, and no doubt Moses trembled at the awesome presence of God on it. And the prophet here just wants God to do it again. I mean, imagine if those hills up there started to shake. How would you feel? If those mountains started to tremble, would you run for cover? Or would you, would you go out and shout, Hallelujah, God has come down. At the crossing of the Red Sea, God came down. In the provision of manna in the wilderness, God had come down. In the giving of waters from the rock, God had come down. When it came to the crossing of the Jordan and flood time, again, God was there. These were unexpected things. But Isaiah was familiar with them. And since he wanted to see it again. 
Beloved, the only thing that's going to change this old world in all its wickedness is for God to come down among us again. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down. May we not only pray for it, but expect it. I mean, if we don't believe or expect what we pray for, <laughs> is the Lord going to move? Do we go through the motions of saying, Lord, send thy Holy Spirit, convict that sinner? We don't expect anything to happen. There's no point in praying if that's, if that's as far as it goes. We must. We know the need. And if we're not deeply conscious of it, then let us pray first of all, God, impress upon my heart just how great the need is. Show me the need. Then, Lord, move my heart to cry to thee until you come down. Come down in all thy risen power. Stir up the people of God. Anoint our eyes with eyes, thou. Give us a fresh vision for those who are perishing. Beloved, listen. Since this meeting commenced, three or four thousand souls have left this scene of time and are now in God's eternity. That's only since eight o'clock. How many of them are in glory? How many of them are lost? And lost for all eternity. Is there not a need for God to move? Who is there in Kilkeel? Who will maybe not see tomorrow morning? Is there somebody out there not saved? Are we going to cry to God that he'll break in? And open that dear one's eyes before they perish? You know... I appreciate the difficulty of the times we're living in. It affects us all. We're all suffering these rising prices and everything else. But if that's our only focus as God's people, if that's all we can think about, how we're going to make ends meet, and surely we have lost the plot. Didn't the Savior himself say, But seek ye first, first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things should be added unto you. God keeps his word. He expects us to obey his word. Must we not then seek him first and foremost? That he will move upon our own hearts and take away all this carelessness, this coldness, this half-heartedness, this lukewarmness. Oh, praise the Lord, you're found in a prayer meeting. It's lovely to see you. Whatever you do, don't stop coming. But let us pray that it will not just be a matter of warming the seat for an hour and a half on a Tuesday evening. But rather it'll be an occasion of seeking God for an honest move of his Holy Spirit upon us. Aye, and that the, the very mountains around us might shake at the presence of God. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down. Oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed. Will you pray to that end, beloved? Pray for a fresh vision for those who are perishing. Pray that God's work will expand and extend in these days. Pray for every sister congregation. God will keep his servants faithful to the blood and to the book. Pray for every effort in the gospel to reach the lost. There's plenty to pray for, isn't there? But let's get started here. Lord, start with my heart. Make me right. In thine own eyes. Oh, that thou hast blessed me indeed. And Lord, come and bless me in such a manner as it'll overflow. 
and that everybody around me will feel the difference. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, send us revival in our hearts. May God encourage us. May the Lord challenge us and stir our hearts to seek his face, even to this end. May the Lord bless these few thoughts to us this evening. I'm going to bow in prayer. If anybody has any particular matter you'd like to leave before the meeting, I'd be happy to hear that. And do, do remember the work here, the meetings on the Lord's Day. The week of meetings that's planned, pray for those. I pray, beloved, for the breath of God upon your own heart and your own soul. Pray for revival. Oh, that thou wouldst revive me indeed. Let's talk to the Lord. And as we go to prayer, can we encourage you? So I'm not telling you how to pray, what to pray for, but it's always good to keep prayer short, even if it's only a few sentences. It keeps a prayer meeting alive. And you can always come back again and pray a couple more sentences, just whatever the Lord puts upon your heart. But let me say that maybe, maybe some feel timid, find it hard to open your mouth in a public prayer meeting. Listen, you are important to the Lord, just as important as anybody who's most eloquent. The Lord's not worried about eloquence. He's more interested in what's in your heart. And just lift your voice to the Lord. Lift your heart to him. Seek his blessing upon your soul, even tonight. Our loving God and our Father, how thankful we are we can call thee our Father. Or there was that time we were of our Father, the devil. We ran after sin, the things of this old world. But we thank thee for that intervening grace that has brought us each one to saving knowledge of Christ the Lord. Thank you for him who loved us and gave himself for us upon the cross. Thank you for what it cost him to save these souls of ours. Thank you, Lord, that we can each one read our titles clear to mansions in the glory. We're on our way to heaven tonight, and all because of Christ. We do recognize, Lord, we have much to praise Thee for. Indeed, all too often, we don't praise Thee enough for the blessings we enjoy. How much, Lord, do we take almost for granted? Oh, thank Thee for every mercy that Thou hast shown. Thank You, Lord, for keeping us from going back into the world and sin. Thank You for saving our families, those who are United in Christ, we thank thee for every child of God. We pray, Lord, for the young in our family circles, for those who are saved, Lord, that you would keep them going on with thyself, and for those in our family circles that are not saved tonight. Lord, we cry to thee for them. Some have been prayed for for years. And they still show no interest, no desire for the things of God. Holding on to sin for just a little while longer. All the while gambling with their very soul. Lord have mercy on them. Open their blinded eyes. Touch our hearts tonight, Lord. Give to us a, a, a stirring of soul, a fresh burden for those who are in danger of perishing. Bless the work in this house. We thank the Lord for the praying of people of God assembled here this evening. This is so encouraging. Lord, bless every believer bowed now in thy presence. As our faces differ, so do our needs, but we thank that every need is met in Christ. Lord, lead us on with thyself. 
give us an honest concern for those around us who need the Savior. Bless every aspect of the work here. Bless every sister congregation. Wherever, Lord, there are praying people met tonight, draw every heart out after thyself. Bless gospel missions that are going on. Cause thy word to prosper. Bring the right people in under the sound of thy word. Save the lost. In all things, Lord, extend thy kingdom. Bring glory and honor to the Christ of God. Pour upon us now, the word, that spirit of true believing prayer. Deliver us from just going through the motions, but help us to believe in what we pray for. Now, my Lord, even before this meeting concludes, may we know something of a breath of revival in our own souls. We ask it in Jesus' name for his sake.